when you look at this, what does it look like to you in five years from now? You know, if you're gonna spend time looking at a screen, right, if you were gonna do a video call anyway, then you know, over time I think it'll feel better to just teleport to a place and be there as a photorealistic version of yourself. I think that that'll be pretty powerful. You know, the point is not to make it so that people are using this all the time, it's just to make it so that the time that we all spend on screens already can be better. And I, I think this can be more immersive and feel a bit more human. It's surprising that I'm saying this, but it feels more human, even though <laughs> it does. I mean, it's like we can actually make eye contact in right. here. Right. No, I'm looking at you. Right, and you're it, looking at yeah. me. Or at least I think yeah. you're looking at me. But Yeah, no, I'm looking at you. Yeah. You know, I think what we see is... Sorry, I have the hiccups. Um, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Having the hiccups it's, in the metaverse. I just pounded my lunch really quickly before jumping in here, you know? Wow. Um, <laughs> but... Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, I don't know if, if, if the gesture of hiccuping is like, is, is one that the face expression thing is really dialed in, but I mean, I think it's actually pretty good on a lot of expressions. I mean, you can like, I mean, moving your mouth around, like, I mean, moving it from side to side. You can even like puff your cheeks, like. <laughs> Mark, I'll just say thank you. I don't know if, you can, if I can give you a pound or how that works. Um, <laughs> thanks. Uh, I look forward to talking to you again, and there's just so much more to talk about, so thank you. All right, glad I got a chance to show you. All right, see ya. Please welcome back to the stage, Andrew Ross Sorkin. By Mark Zuckerberg, the CEO of Meta, as you might imagine, virtually, uh, in only the way uh, that Mark would. We didn't want to do this uh, fully in the metaverse. Hey, Mark, it's great to see you. Hey, um, good to see you, too. No well, hiccups, you hiccups this time. Right in there. But uh, everybody just saw, saw the hiccups, uh, I think. Um, and I want to maybe, maybe, by the way, talking about hiccups, maybe that's even a way to start, uh, which is to say, you've, you've talked about this, this dream of, uh, of the metaverse and have invested an enormous amount in it. And right now, there are lots of questions about what that dream looks like and how much that dream is gonna cost. And we're now at a time where Silicon Valley has been challenged, evaluations of so many of these companies have come down and you're now dealing I think uh, for the first time with layoffs, we just talked to Andy Jassy, who's also uh, dealt with layoffs. So tell us just what's going on in your head right now, um, given all of the, the, cost, the, the cross currents of pressures, uh, if you will, that, that, uh, that are out there, and frankly, the doubters. Sure, so uh, I, I think things look very different on a 10 year time horizon than the zone that we're in for the next few years. On a, on a you know five to ten year time horizon, I'm still completely optimistic about all the things that we were that we've been optimistic about. You know, I think that there will continue to the computing platforms that we use will continue to evolve. The media will continue to evolve. When I when I started the company, you know, most people online were sharing text. Then it moved to photos. When we got cameras and you know phones that um, that that had cameras all the time, and you know, as the mobile networks got better, it moved to video. The way we want to communicate keeps getting richer and more immersive. And our computing platforms keep on getting more natural and ubiquitous. And I, I just think that the inevitable trend of that is, you know, as, as you get a new major computing platform every 10, you know, 15, 20 years, um, you know, that like video is not going to be the end of the line. Phones are not going to be the end of the line. Right? We're not going to be here in the 2030s communicating and using computing devices that are exactly the same as what we have today. Um, and someone has to build that and invest in it and believe in it. And there's a lot of new technology that needs to get invented to create that. So I'm still very optimistic about that. Um, and I'm happy to go as deep as you want on, on all of that, well, what, just, what it means for our, our right. mission and, um, and the business and strategy. Well, but obviously, yeah. for the next few years, and I think we're in a zone where operating with more efficiency and discipline is going to be more critical. And, you know, I think, you know, I made this mistake I think some other business leaders did too, but I think we made a, in some ways, particularly acute version of this, where we read the economic and business indicators in 2021 at the height of the pandemic um, as more likely to continue this huge pull forward in e-commerce and online commerce. Um, so when I was planning out our long-term spending, you know, I just, you know, I planned out massive investments in AI infrastructure and, um, and you know a number of other long-term things, silicon for the 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 kind of hardware to support the metaverse that um, that are you know five-year investments. 
that we spun up because we thought that the the um, the economy and the business were going to go in, in a certain direction. And obviously, it hasn't turned out that way. You know, not only you know the macro economy, um, but I think things like Apple's policies on ATT um, have 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 been hard. Um, so yeah, we, we we've had to had to pull back. Um, you know, still kind of pushing forward in the same direction over the long term, but but with a our, our kind of operational focus over the next few years is going to be on efficiency and um, and discipline and rigor and and kind of just operating in a much tighter environment. I want to get to the apple of it in a moment, but uh, let's let's talk though about the investment piece of it, not just in Meta, but what you think that the the company and the earnings of the company can support in terms of these investments. I think oftentimes you look at a lot of the analyst reports on Wall Street and they say, I just wish they weren't investing in this. It's just too early. Yeah, I mean, look, this is, these, are, these are long-term investments. And I think over the, the cycle of playing this out, we're going to go through a lot of different seasons, right? Seasons where people are, are pretty optimistic about long-term um, you know, investments and, and ones where people are more, more skeptical. And I, I just think part of seeing things through over the long term is powering through some of that. Um, in terms of you know the investment portfolio for the company, you know about eighty percent of of our investments, a little bit more, go towards the the core business, which we call our family of apps, right? So that's Facebook, Instagram, WhatsApp, Messenger, and the ads business associated with that. And then you know, a little less than twenty percent of our investment goes towards Reality Labs, which is the the future work on building out the software and hardware platforms around the metaverse. Um, so you know, it's still the, the vast majority of what we're doing is is and will continue to be going towards um, social media for for quite some time until the metaverse becomes a, a larger thing. And I think you can you can debate whether you know on the order of of twenty percent is 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 too much for this bet, but it's it's not the majority of what we're doing. And then within that, um, it sort of breaks down into three major platforms. One is the the social platform, and of some of what you showed in that video, um, which is really more of a continuation of you know, what is, is social media and what is the social experiences that we're going to want to have in a more immersive environment? I think that's like the, the most basic thing that we're going to do, but it's actually a, a relatively small part of the overall Reality Labs work because software ends up being very efficient to develop. Um, of the rest, you know, it's a, maybe about, you know, 40% goes towards our VR investment where, you know, it's already, you know, we're selling quite a few units. I, I think we're, we're investing a level that is um, sort of on par with what Microsoft did with um, when investing in Xbox at its peak. So, and I think the results that we're seeing right now are kind of like a game console. So, you know, obviously, we don't aspire to just build a game console. Um, you know, we we want it to be a general computing platform. But I think it's pretty likely that you know a downside case is that's where it turns out. And you know, I don't right. think Microsoft regrets building the Xbox. So I think that that's fine. Um, AR is really the big thing long term, right? About half or more of the investment that we're making in Reality Labs is going towards building what I think is the long-term most important form factor, which is just normal-looking glasses that can put holograms um, in the world. So, you know, we do a version of this conversation five years from now, and instead of me on a, on a video conference, you have a, another chair next to you, and I'm just there as a hologram. Um, like, I think that's pretty wild and can start enabling a lot of, um, a, a lot of really right. compelling use cases for presence between people. But, me, uh, but yeah, this is, this is a long-term thing. Let, but let, we're going to stay focused on the, the family of apps. Let me ask you about that, though, because a lot of people, I mean, it was funny, and I said it in the video, uh, I felt it was more human. In a very strange way, when we were in, in, in the metaverse together uh, about a week ago when we taped that, I thought actually the conversation was more human than the one we're having now. And I know that's almost impossible for people uh, to believe when you're looking at it in a sort of, we're 2D right now and, and looking at us 2D uh, in the metaverse. But a lot of people have concerns and say, are we really gonna spend all day in the metaverse? Are we really gonna wear these goggles all day? What's that gonna be like? What, what, do, you, what do you say to, to them? And on a personal level, I'm so curious because just how you deal with what has been a lot of doubters uh, about, about this, this vision and endeavor. Well, okay. I mean, I've had doubters and we've had doubters the whole time, you know, the almost 20 years I've run the company. You know, people thought, okay, this is just a college thing. Oh, it's a fad. Oh, it seems to be working, but it's not going to make much money. Oh, you went to mobile, but like, that's not going to work well as a business. Okay. It's working well. Or are you going to be able to like handle the content issues? It's I, like, I mean, I think that this is just, this comes with the, it's par for the course is that, you know, it's that there are people are, you know, I think to some degree, if you're not, you know, if you're not getting a bunch of skepticism, then you're probably not pushing hard enough on the future. So, um, so that that part, uh, I think, I, I try to listen to the critique because I think a lot of, there are a lot of smart and thoughtful people who are giving it, and it's coming from a place of wisdom where I think we can learn and improve by internalizing some of it. But 
Um, but the, but skepticism by itself doesn't bother me that much. In terms of what um, I mean, what do we see for the future? I think VR and AR are going to play different roles in people's lives. Um, AR, I think, is going to subsume more of how you think about mobile computing, right? So it's more like a phone-like use case. Um, you know, you could totally see being out in the world and wearing it and, you know, getting directions as you're driving through through a heads-up display or getting messages and, and being able to respond to them discreetly and seamlessly without having to pull out something or type just by, you know, sending some, right. you know, like a, a signal from your from your mind. Um, which is sounds wild, and we can go do a whole tangent on that. But that I'm actually pretty confident is going to happen within the next five years. Um, and VR, I think, is it occupies a different role. I think that that's more immersive, um, and in 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 the sense of what you do when you're on a computer or TV. Which you know, I think it's easy for yeah, you, you don't like walk down the street watching a TV, but you know the average American still spends about half their time on screens in front of TVs and computers. So it's not all phones. Um, so I think that that's that ends up being an important part of this too. Um, and to what you were saying before about this feeling more human, um, you know, there is just this dynamic. It's it's funny to, to kind of transpose it to a 2D screen. So I mean, sometimes when you show the videos of what it looks like in VR, it can look a little silly. But the, the whole technology is about delivering a sense of presence and making it feel like you're really there with another person. So it's all these things like, like how you move, how they move, right. the ability to make eye contact. Um, you know, it's a, in, in like, spatial audio, right? The fact that you know, if when we were sitting next to each other in that conference room and you were sitting to my right and you spoke, it sounded like the, the audio was coming from the right, right? And you know, right. so much of our memories and how we, how we perceive the world is spatial, right? We, we kind right. of, um, you know, we, we, we just kind of think about and remember, okay, I remember that you were sitting to my right in that meeting. Right. Whereas, you know, I'm on a Zoom call all day long, you know, they all kind of look the same. It's a grid and, and like you, you kind of lack a sense of space and it sort of blends together. So yeah, we don't have the photo realism today, right? So the avatars will obviously right. get better over time, but uh, but I think in some way these th this already delivers a, a better sense of presence and this will just right. get a lot stronger over the next, you know, three to five years. Uh, you, you mentioned Apple uh, earlier and, and they obviously changed their privacy policies. That's had an impact on your business and a lot of other businesses. Um, when you think though about the strength of Instagram and classic Facebook, and I think part of what's happened here, at least on the Wall Street side of it, is everyone thinks that the whole company is now focused in this other way towards towards Meta, and I think you're saying that's not the case. But tell us about sort of what you're seeing in terms of the advertising piece of this on the traditional platforms that everybody's already using, um, and where you see the strength or not, given the conversations we've been having all day with the Treasury Secretary and Larry Fink and uh, Andy Jassy about the economy overall. Yeah, sure. So first, let's talk about kind of engagement and the community trends. Then we can talk about the 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 revenue piece of this. But my perception is is what yours is 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 that is basically I think a lot of people think like okay we're we're just wholly focused on the metaverse. We're not focused on on the the, the social media part and the family of apps. And I know that's that's basically wrong. I mean, it's you know the vast majority of of my time and the the vast majority of of the company's effort is going towards um, towards the social media efforts. The um, the engagement that we're seeing in these apps is strong. I think that people, um, I think that there's somewhat of a perception that the, that it's not going as well for some reason. But internally, from all the numbers that we see, you know, the, the the metrics are strong. Engagement is going well. We have bets like Reels, um, which is you know short form video is increasingly important. It's hard to exactly track how we're doing compared to competitors like TikTok. Um, but if you look at external data and you try to extrapolate. You know, we, we don't really have any data on how they're doing in China, but if you look at outside of data, um, some of the external metrics suggest that, you know, Reels is maybe about half the time of TikTok globally um, outside of China. So, you know, obviously we don't aspire to be half of anything, but um, but compared to where we were, you know, a year ago, maybe teens or something like that, mm -hmm. um, you know, the trends have been pretty good and we're, we're, we're making progress on that. That's growing. Um, we get good feedback from uh, from people in our community about, that the, the quality is improving. So the engagement side of things, I think, is, is going quite well, and my guess is a bit better than, than, um, than people perceive externally. Right. On the monetization side, there's, you know, there's the advertising piece, which you know, there's, it really does look a little bit different depending on you know, which continent you're talking about. I mean, the US economy seems you know, a bit stronger. Europe um, has a bit more challenges. Um, China is obviously difficult to predict. I think it's gone better over the last year. Uh, we don't have a consumer service in China, but but Chinese advertisers sometimes buy ads in order to export right. to, to the countries where we do run. Um, 
and and you know in China obviously with the with the um, the turmoil right now it's hard to predict exactly how that'll go but but I mean those have sort of been been different zones that have just behaved in, in very different ways and then the other thing that I'd say for our business is you know the advertising part really primarily touches Facebook and Instagram which are the advertising platforms at scale WhatsApp is largely untapped in terms of how to monetize it and two billion people are using it um, right. you know, every day so or you know on a daily basis on average so that's really the next platform that we're focused on bringing online from a business messaging and, and monetization perspective. And I think the potential there is going to be pretty big over the next few years as well. Let me ask you a, a different question about Apple. And Apple as a uh, platform and as a governor, if you will, uh, on so many other apps, including your own. Um, you probably saw Elon Musk has uh, gone into battle uh, to some degree with Apple. You've gone into battle uh, with, with Apple as well in, in, in certain ways. And I know Elon and you seem to have a uh, something that I, I don't know. I've seen him do some trolling and whatnot. Um, but what what do you think of that? Just this this idea of of Apple or Google having all having that power, and is that power a good thing or a bad thing? And I, I'll I'll make one suggestion, which is: is it possible it's a good thing, in so far as it is a governor potentially, in the same way that advertising is sort of a free market governor? Uh, on the system, or is it that because they have so much influence, they have too much influence? Well, look, if you look at the at all the major computing platforms that, that have existed, Windows, Android, iOS, hopefully the, the future ones around the metaverse that will get built, Apple's stands out as the only one where one company can control what, de what apps get on the device, right? That wasn't the case in Windows. That isn't really the case on on Android phones. I mean, Google might control what goes in the in the in the Play Store, but they've always made it so that you could sideload and have other app stores um, and and you know work directly with with um, with with um, you know phone manufacturers. And that's also been our commitment in in how we've built up our VR and and what we plan to do with the AR headsets. Is we allow sideloading, we allow um, streaming from PCs. Um, so I, I do think Apple has sort of singled themselves out as the only company that is trying to control um, like unilaterally what, what apps get on a device. And I, I don't think that's a sustainable or good place to be. Um, so I, I, I don't know. I mean, I, I've been, I think I've been pretty vocal on, on, on this, um, but uh, that's, that's, right. you know, I, I, I just think it's, it's a, you know, the platform is, is, is too important, right? I mean, it's, you know, I, 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 I like exactly how, the law defines, you know, what a dominant platform is. I, I think varies from place to place, but I mean, the reality is, is that the you know vast majority of the profits in the mobile ecosystem go towards Apple. They have, I think, the majority of people in the U.S. have have iPhones. It, certainly, the majority right. of the the economic um, you know activity on phones goes towards that. So, I I, I do think it is it, it is problematic for for one company to be able to control what what kind of app experiences get on the device. But, but how do you think about these power dynamics, right? Because now we have Elon Musk on one side. I'm very curious what you think of his acquisition of Twitter. You have you, uh, who uh, controls in large part, uh, or almost wholly, uh, Meta. And then, obviously, Apple and Google and these other forces, and, and, and everybody is sort of battling it out. Yeah, I mean, there, there are a lot of forces that that create accountability for people to make sure that we're acting in, in customers' interests. The number one is, is still, um, you know, basically people and, and what they want to use. And it's clearly a very competitive space, right? I mean, if you look at just how TikTok has emerged over the last few years and gotten to more than a billion people, I mean, anyone who says that, that the social media space is not incredibly dynamic and there's not like a lot of new stuff that's getting created, I, I think just isn't looking at what's going on. Um, that's pretty clear is you need to keep focused on innovation and um, you know having succeeded in the past doesn't mean that you get to go build the next set of things you have to really keep on pushing and doing well at that and um, in some ways being willing to cannibalize some of the past right. stuff that you've built in order to push forward for the future so you have that and then I think you have a, a set of kind of regulators and, and governments around the world who are increasingly active on these topics but you know I think customers get to choose what they think is good governments in, you know, in general, are elected um, in order to look out for people's interests. I think the, the the problem that you get into with with the platform control is that 
I mean, Apple obviously has their own interests, and, and part right. of the, the, the challenge here is that they're, you know, one of our big competitors. So, right. you know, the fact that, you know, companies have to deliver um, their apps exclusively right. through platforms that are controlled by competitors where the competitors can control, I, I think that that's, it's, there's not like, there is a conflict of interest there that doesn't make, that makes them not just a, a, a kind of governor that is looking out for the best of, of, of people's interests. I think that they also have a lot of their own strategic interests, which about, makes it very challenging. What do you think about the idea that certain sites are gonna be now platforming other people? I mean, Elon with Twitter has decided he's, everybody back in the pool, everybody's back on, on the site, in, including President Trump. You guys have not uh, made that choice. Um, would you, and, and who should be controlling these decisions? Well, I mean, I, I tend to think that you don't want you know, one person or one company making those decisions, which is why we pioneered this oversight board for our content decisions so that people have a have a vehicle um, that they can appeal to outside of us. Um, but but look, I think it's good that companies take different approaches. I mean, you can you can agree or disagree with what Elon is doing or how he's doing it, but I, I do think it's going to be very interesting to see how this plays out in terms of the approaches he's taking. And I, I would guess that you know not everything is going to work, but right. I think. Some things might work, and I think even he would say that not everything is going to work. So I, I kind of think the the world um, and the industry gets more interesting when people take some different approaches, and and um, and I, I think it's completely reasonable if if some platforms conclude that that they want to um, have some different policies than than others. Ours, we've gotten to our policies from you know years of of experience and and kind of getting feedback of what people want on the services, and you know trying to provide the most expression that we think we can while keeping a, a platform where um, where we're keeping people right. safe. And um, and it's it's obviously there's not like one line on that that is like the right place to be. I think that there are value judgments on that and, and also how you execute that matters. Right. But, um, you know, it's we, we've kind of evolved to where we are. And, and, and where are you on regulation? I was gonna say, I just saw, by the way, overnight, Mark, uh, there's a deep fake of you. I, you've probably seen it too, maybe, uh, talking about Congress and, and all sorts of things. And it looks like you. It's really you. I mean, and it's, it's something uh, to behold if, if you haven't seen it. And I, I'm wondering how concerned you are about things like that and who is supposed to be the governor on that. Well, I mean, we do have policies around deep fakes. I mean, we kept that up because it was also, you know, it was clear that it was a deep fake. Um, it, it said that. Um, it, it sort of was making a parody, right? So I think, you know, allowing people to, to do humor is important. Allowing people to show new technologies is important. If someone was really trying to trick people, um, and and th then I think that that would potentially be a, a different situation. And, and, and that's why, you know, we have a policy around that. But I don't think you want to you know, have policies that get rid of all humor or, or kind of demonstrating things. But yeah, I mean, the, the, the threat landscape evolves. I think some things evolve faster than others, um, you know, in terms of, you know, people being, you know, rude to each other or, or hateful that, um, you know, fortunately is not evolving at a, an extremely fast rate, although it does evolve in terms of how, how people speak, but technology does, um, you know, nation state interference evolves quicker because that's more of an adversarial dynamic where when you have countries that are trying to, um, to, to kind of get involved in each other's affairs and, um, and, and create networks of, of fake accounts. Their tactics evolve right. pretty quickly, and we need to um, be, be very focused on that. Hey, Mark, we're about to run out of time. We're gonna have the CEO of TikTok on uh, uh, here with us in person a little bit later. Uh, you've been concerned about TikTok, um, obviously as a competitor, but also about the national security issues in China. What's, what's your take at this point? I mean, it's, it's very complicated. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't actually know the, the TikTok folks that well, so it's hard for me to judge you know, their, their situation specifically, but one of the things that I think is always interesting, you know, as an as an American CEO and I travel abroad, is that people assume that because I'm, you know, we're, we're American, that like all the data that we have goes to the U.S. government, which of course isn't true. But the reason why they think that is because in a lot of other countries that is true, and that's how how business operates. Is that you know business and the and the governments are are kind of much more tightly linked. And I, I do just think that that probably is a reality of how things operate in China. Um, is that it's it's very difficult to run a business without like the government being on your board and being embedded in your company and having access to to data. So I, I do just think like that's a, that raises a a very complex set of questions about like what do you what do you do with that? Um, and you know I, I I think you know a bunch of the folks who work at TikTok, um, you know I'm sure they're trying to do the right thing and I'm sure it's it's complicated. 
but um but I, I do think that there are real there are real questions there that I think at least need to be grappled with. I, I don't propose to you know have the answer to this, but I I I, I think that it it is it is a real question. Mark, uh, I know we're out of time. I want to thank you for your time. Uh, I'm glad we could do this uh, virtually without any hiccups. So thank yeah. you very very much, thank you. Thank and I look forward to seeing you in person. Mark Zuckerberg, everybody, thank you. All right, see ya.